To have a virtuous mindset means one big thing. And if you do that well, then all the results will come. When you're rooted in a why, it's extremely powerful because you keep coming back to that. What is your business at the end of the day? It's the people that work there. Before going, I was nervous about the climate of the terrain. People were sending me articles saying five people have died on that trek this year already. Are you sure you want to do it? And my friends and family said, are you mad? Are you crazy? I just realized I can't do this. I can't imagine myself doing this for the next 20, 30 years. I need to do something where I feel fulfilled. We forget to live in the now and enjoy what's happening now. Sanjay, welcome to the Virtuous Mindset podcast. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I remember we met a good few months ago and I remember coming to your Finding Your Purpose event in central London, Omnom, and I was so inspired by the conversation. I remember thinking to myself, I really want you to come on this podcast and I'm so nervous to ask you. I'm so <laughs> hesitant, but I asked you towards the end and you said yes without any hesitation. So it's real pleasure. It's great to be here and great to talk about things that I'm passionate about as well and yeah. finding your purpose, helping people, helping clients do that. Is something that I, I genuinely feel is a is a gift in my life. So always happy to share and be here with you. Yeah, definitely. Well, before we get started, it's interesting because your career is you've you've gone from being a teacher to then gone into trading. Mm. You've been at Merrill Lynch for four years, and then you you're now a corporate coach and you have set up your own business, Echios. Can you give us a brief introduction in terms of yourself? and your journey. Sure, you yeah, absolutely. So when I was at university, I studied engineering. And quite often, when you're young, you don't know what it is that you really want to do. And you're, you're fairly sheltered, you're, you're able to make some choices in life, but those choices are quite limited. You might choose the A-levels that you want to do, and then you choose the university that you'd like to go to out of a handful of things, and then you're directed towards a certain degree. But at 18, or 17, when you start making those decisions, you don't know anything about life. And it feels as though whatever choice you make at that point is going to define where your life ends up. And so I'm one of those people that gets bored quite quickly. I am fairly impatient in life. And so I made a choice to do engineering, but very quickly realized whilst I love mathematics and solving those problems, it wasn't me. I, I couldn't imagine myself in a lab or, or, or working in an engineering firm. So then I saw this in incredible program called Teach First. I don't know if you've, you've heard yeah, of it. I yeah, I have. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so I was on the first cohort of that. And when I read the web page at the time, it said, we're looking for people that want to make a difference in this world. And that spoke to me. We're looking for people that are up for a challenge, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that spoke to me. And I'd be working with children, helping develop them in, in hard schools, in inner city schools. And I thought, this is me. I have to do this. So I started off with Teach First, which was an incredible program. And then as I was going through that program, I realized it's not putting, pushing my intellect forward. Mm. So I'm doing this great work with children, but I'm teaching year nine GCSEs or sorry, year nine, year 10 GCSEs, quite simple maths. And I need to still push my mind forward. And the idea of the program was that once you finish, you can then go and work in industry. It's sponsored by industry. So I got a job at Merrill Lynch on the trading floor building algos. And that was great fun as well. I enjoyed it. I was solving complex problems. But then I thought to myself, hmm, this doesn't really suit my nature. And, mm. and I, I want to talk about nature later on with you because yeah. it's really important to figure out your nature and who, what are the types of things that you like doing, but also you're good at. And I realized I'm good at maths and solving problems, mm. but I don't like being tied to a desk for 40, 50 hours a week coming in and the same group of people, nice people. But for me, it didn't suit my nature. And so I took that courageous step to take a pay cut and went to work for a, a firm that was doing training in the financial space. And I headed up the leadership and management development side of the business. And so we went out to clients offering them a range of courses and coaching on how to become more effective leaders. How do you make sure that your workforce are inspired? And for me, that was just, it was like, putting a rocket on my back and, and my career just took a, a totally different trajectory. We sold that business in 2013 and then I founded 
Ekios. Mm. And now we work with some of the largest names in technology, finance, and also consultancy as well. Mm. So what was your why behind creating Ekios? Because so many people don't know what their why is. Yeah. I'd be intrigued to know. That's, that's a really good point. And when we work with clients, we'll ask them, what are your, why are you doing this thing? Why do you want to do whatever it is that you're doing? Because that, that why is so important. If you haven't established that, then as your goal gets really difficult, because it will, it will mm. get so difficult. If you ha if you aren't grounded by your why, you will just let it go. And that's why most businesses do fail. When people start their businesses, they fail because then they're, they're not sure about the why. They think they know the why. Mm. Then it gets difficult, it gets tough. Clients don't necessarily like the product. It doesn't go in the way you wanted. You have difficulty with your employees and then you go, oh, just, just give up, why, why bother? Um, but when you're rooted in a why, it's extremely powerful because you keep coming back to that. For me, the why was making a difference to people and organizations, but also I love creating something. Mm. If I've got the opportunity to create something and look back and go, oh, we, we made that. It, it feels good to me. That's, that my, that's my engineering side come out. Yeah, definitely. Well, it feels like a full circle moment because you're combining your education, your 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 work when you were a teacher mm. with the fact that you've come from a trading background and now you're a coach. So it definitely feels like it's all come together. And it's interesting because I saw online yeah. when I was doing my research mm. that you developed an e-learning platform for, uh, for a number of different companies that mm -hmm. was used in eight out of 10 different finance companies. And you've also worked with the likes of JP Morgan, Barclays, Nomura. These are all really amazing achievements achievements have you ever had an instance of imposter syndrome where you thought to yourself gosh I can't actually mm. do this I'm not as I'm not as qualified to do this job and I'm pitching all these finance companies but i there are other people out there that are more experienced than me mm -hmm. so what what what's your experience of that this this term imposter syndrome I, th I think is a fairly new term but it's always existed when I started as, as a coach I was 26 years old mm. and I know that people wouldn't take me seriously if they knew I was 26 years old. Yeah. Because I think, how is this person who's only 26 going to tell me what to do? You've got mm. no real experience. Mm. And so I had to pretend to be 30. If anyone yeah. asked me, I'd say, oh, I'm, th I'm 30. It was, <laughs> it was a white lie. And I think I'm OK with it. But at that point, I did have some of that imposter syndrome. I thought to myself, yeah, how am I going to tell somebody who's way more experienced than I am how to do something? Th the problem is just because someone's done something for so long it doesn't mean that they necessarily get better at it unless they're accepting feedback unless they're trying to learn from the mistakes that they've made etc so actually you could have loads of experience but that doesn't mean you get better at what you do and I was given the opportunity when we started this coaching company to take time out read lots of books learn from other people's experiences learn from other people's mistakes and then apply that in other people's lives and for me that has the that has that has power it's it's an ability to look at a situation look at what's going on in a company let's say a management team or you're looking at employees who may be not so happy with the work that they do or they want to develop their communication skills well there's a science behind communication skills mm. if i can understand the science behind how to communicate effectively then i can show someone how to do that now, when I was 26, that was great and it worked. Mm. Now I'm a little bit older <laughs> <laughs> and I've got my own experiences. I'm, I'm way more confident now when I deliver any sort of coaching programs. Yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, there'll be people listening to this and mm. they'll be thinking them to, to, the, to themselves. That's all well and good. Yeah. The fact that you can coach all these huge financial players in the market. Yeah. How do I tackle something like imposter syndrome? How do mm -hmm. I get out mm -hmm. of my head and make sure that I'm able to achieve my goals ultimately? Yeah. I get that a lot with people, with clients that I coach. They'll say, I'm in this position. I've just been I've just been promoted to managing director and I feel as though I'm not worthy. I'm not I'm not up to the job. And I have to have them do a lot of introspection and remind themselves of what got you to this position. Mm. As in you are here now. What got you there? And there is this famous saying, and I'm sure you've heard it. And people say it all the time. Fake it till you make it. Yeah, I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everyone exactly. has. Every, everyone has, and they fake it till they make it. Yeah. But you still feel as though you're being a little bit fake and inauthentic. Mm. People want to be authentic. And so I have this belief that anybody can tap into the energy or ability to do almost anything that they want. 
Mm. It's there within us, whether you call it the universe or whatever. You you have the ability to tap into the energy. You just have to you just have to find out how to do that. It could be, let's say, you're a manager and mm. you suddenly become a manager. And you feel like I don't know how to do this. Well, there are plenty of books that you can read that can help you with that. There are plenty of coaches you can come to and say, "Hey, this is the bit that I'm not great at. Can you help me with this?" Yeah, absolutely, we can help you with that. So whatever it is that you're struggling with. Write it out. Make it clear. Say this is the thing that I feel an imposter about, and then work on developing it. Yeah, it, everything can be accomplished when you actually work towards doing something. Mm. Uh, I, I was recently in Nepal. We did this trek into the Himalayas. Yeah. This is this is going back a couple of months now, and before going, I was nervous about the climate. I was nervous about the terrain. People were sending me articles saying. Five people have died on that trek this year already. Are you sure you want to do it? And I thought, no, I actually, I definitely want to do this. But to get there and do it, I know I had to train for a good three, four months before going, and train hard, train heavy, so that when I was there, I was able to do it. And it's the same with any role that you're going to take on. You can work towards being the person that you want to be. You just have to work towards it. Yeah, definitely. It's almost like taking those baby steps in order to end up at that bigger goal. Absolutely. I think that some, sometimes people will look at a particular goal they want to achieve and mm -hmm. see it as a mountain that they need to climb. But actually, it's taking those baby steps and making sure that you're doing it on a regular basis mm -hmm. that makes all the difference. Yeah, right? absolutely. And, and we can talk about it and use that that metaphor of getting up the mountain and those baby steps. And, and when you said that, it just reminded me of that journey. Yeah. When we, when we started our journey and we were looking at Annapurna, which is the, the, the base camp that we we're heading to. Yeah. And our guide said, look in the distance. Can you see there? That's where we're going. And it looks so far and in the middle of nowhere. I was thinking, how are we going to get there over the next three days? Mm. And then when you're there and you look back and you see the terrain that you've walked through, you think, how did we do that? How did I, I actually came from that place to, to here now? Mm. And how did we do it? Literally one step at a time. Yeah. And so yeah. that's that's a, that's a great point that you make. Yeah, no, definitely. I think it it's it feels daunting, but actually mm -hmm. when you make that effort, it makes yeah. all the difference Absolutely. for sure. I want to switch gears because I know that we spoke on Teams mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago and you mentioned something called servant leadership to me, okay. and yeah. I must admit that I had to google it. I didn't know what it was. Fine. For those that are listening, can you tell us a, bl a little bit about what servant leadership is? I, I can tell you my views of it. And quite often when we look at models around leadership, there'll be lots of theory. But this is how I practice servant leadership. For me, I view the team as an incredible group of people. And it's my job as the leader to serve them. Mm -hmm. Idea being that they are in charge of things in my business. They're in charge of client accounts, they're in charge of operations, they're in charge of delivering coaching as well. And it's my job to make sure they can do the absolute best they can in their role. We're almost flipping the paradigm of leadership rather than me being at the top and everybody wor working towards serving me. I see my goal as working towards serving them. Mm. And in fact, I have this view and I say it to the team all the time. If I can be redundant in my role, then I've achieved what I wanted to in this business. If I can run this business and you don't need me, that is the, the best place I can actually be. That's the best place we can get this business to. Yeah, definitely. And there's an interesting analogy when it comes to leadership, yeah. because Simon Sinek, who yeah. is a leadership expert, compares leadership, servant leadership, with this idea of parenthood, mm. and that as a parent, you are nurturing your child, you're putting your child's needs first. Mm. And as they grow and develop, you're making sure that you're adapting and changing accordingly. Yeah. And that's highly applicable to something like servant leadership. Absolutely. What are your thoughts on that? Would you would you say you agree? Yeah. If, if anyone's a parent, then they'll know this they'll feeling. They'll understand, they'll, right? They'll, they'll know this feeling that that you end up serving your children a lot when they're babies what are you doing you're changing their nappies yeah. you're feeding them you're making sure that they're that we were in center parks uh, two weeks ago and <laughs> i remember people saying oh did you have a nice break and i thought yeah i had a great time with the kids but actually it was tiring i was yeah. i was working hard i was making sure that they'd they'd eaten on time I was making sure that they've had enough exercise taking them swimming etc and, and it's quite yeah. tiring but also rewarding at the end of the day when you get into bed, you give them a kiss, they say, I love you, Papa. It, it feels really nice and, and it's rewarding. But yeah. we, we also have to 
be careful to balance our own energies as well. Mm. And just as a parent, you have to make sure that you're balancing your energy. As a leader, you also have to make sure that you're balancing your energy mm. and that you're not too busy. I feel as though in this in this current world, we've mm. created this culture of being busy all mm, the time. Yeah. And you ask someone, you say, how's it going? And they say, oh, I'm, so, I'm so busy. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's yeah. so true. Yeah, they'll say busy yeah. and we'll, we'll regard busyness as being a value. Yeah. And I, I'm not judging anyone that says that. I say it all the time. I'll often say, oh, it's very, very busy. And you think, oh, the more busy you are, the more successful you must be. But actually, I think it's probably the other way around. <laughs> we, we, we've confused it. So as a leader as well, you, you want to make sure that you are balancing your time. And, and when you invest mm -hmm. time in your team to empower them, mm -hmm. that's when you then get the space to innovate in your company and organization. Mm. So if I can invest my time at the beginning into every person in my team, making sure that they are able to lead as mm. well, then I can step away from some of those things. There'll be times now where, and when I went to Nepal, this is a great example of this. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to, I had my phone off for, for 10 days. Mm. And when I came back, the business was in great shape. It was, it was Everything was running, clients had been... Um, yeah, that people had met the needs of clients, etc. And I felt as though, wow, this machine is finally working. And I said to the team, I felt as though I was like a parent leaving leaving my children to it. And I come back and the house is, hasn't been burnt down. You haven't set anything on, on, you haven't had a crazy party or anything like that. It, and it felt so rewarding seeing them all flourish and the business operating without me. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you mentioned this point around balance and mm. that's, I was thinking about that because during the pandemic, there were so many businesses that yeah. were struggling to stay afloat. They were struggling and so many of them went under. And so how do you balance your role as a servant leader with making sure that your business is profitable? Because there'll, there'll be people listening to this and thinking, well, during the pandemic, your priority surely should be about profitability Absolutely. and making sure that the business yeah. is actually flourishing. So yeah. what do you say to that? If we assume that being a servant leader means that you are prioritizing the people over the business, then we've misunderstood what being a servant leader is. Mm. Because the idea is that if you're prioritizing the business, you're prioritizing the people within the business. And if you're prioritizing the people, you're prioritizing the business. What is your business at the end of the day? It's the people that work there. Mm -hmm. And so in the pandemic, we struggled at the beginning, but actually we had some two really good years. Mm. And uh, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic saying to people, look, I'm not gonna let anybody go. We're gonna innovate. We're gonna find ways to get through this. And I want you as people in this business who are stakeholders in the success of this business, I want you to think of ways that we can innovate Mm -hmm. And we sat together, we brainstormed and I tell everyone in the business, look, this is this is your business. We're a family. We've got to work this out. Mm. And we came up with some incredible ideas and virtual options that we could mm -hmm. offer to clients. And they helped bolster the business. They helped us, like I said, have two really incredible years. So I, I don't think they're they're mutually exclusive. I don't think it's a case of if we look after the people, we, we don't look after the business. We, looking after the people means looking after the business. Looking after the business means looking after the people. Yeah, so they go side by side almost. Yeah, hand in hand. Hand in hand, yeah, yeah. definitely. But I suppose on, on, on when I'm thinking about what mm -hmm. makes somebody a good servant leader, I'm yeah. thinking about someone who's selfless, who's empowering, who puts people first. Yeah. Not everybody possesses those qualities and those mm -hmm. key characteristics. So you're running a business. You've yeah. got Ekios. You founded it. How do you train others to to become good, effective servant leaders? Within this idea of being a servant leader is something called humility. Mm. And we often misunderstand what humility means. We look at humility and we think humility means weakness. Yeah. And actually, humility means strength. If mm. you can be truly humble, it means that you're able to put yourself in a position where you don't have imposter syndrome. Mm. You know all of your capabilities, but you're there and ready to work and do whatever is required for the sake of the business and the people within the business. Often those who are insecure and don't have strength, they have, they have a challenge with humility and the mm. opposite of humility is pride if you like or mm. ego they feel as though they need to exert their power exert what they know etc and so for me this coming back to this idea servant leadership is about being humble which means being receptive to other people's ideas listening to any concerns that people will have 
and I will ask people in the business, I've got this idea. This is an idea. This is a view that I've got. What do you think of this? And I want you to be brutally honest. And mm. when you allow someone to be honest about their ideas and listen, then you encourage them to be honest again and again and again. And then sometimes I might listen to those ideas from the team and I'll listen. I go, hey, that's a really good idea. I like that. And other times I might go, actually, my experience is telling me we should go in this direction. Mm. But I try to remove as much ego as I can from my own ideas or or the ways in which I deal with people and I tell everyone in the team this is a this is a no ego company we're going to make yeah. sure that you everybody and I have this saying in the company if one person's winning we're all winning if mm. one person's not doing so well then we need to help that person do much better Mm. Ego is a really interesting thing because mm. especially when you're running your own business, you may have a certain train of thought and yeah. you may be thinking, I want to go in this particular direction. Yeah. How do we remove ego? How do we get rid of it? There's this great book. It's De Bono's Thinking Hats. I don't know if you've, you've come across it, no, but it's, no. it's an incredible book. And he talks about this idea that whoever, in fact, before we, we talk about that, quite often when we come up with an idea, we're emotionally attached to that idea. And our ego is linked to it. So if anybody challenges it, it feels as though they're challenging us. Mm. But they're not. They're challenging the idea. And if me as a business owner, I want my business to thrive, I want whatever idea is going to help my business thrive. I have to first remember that. I don't care if the idea came from me or if the idea came from one of my employees mm. or it came from a competitor. I want the best idea that's going to help my business thrive. And if I, if I think with that mindset, that's extremely powerful. Mm. And so De Bono's idea is that we remove emotion from our decisions as these different thinking hats. And you put these different thinking hats on. One would be you put a positive thinking hat and you go, right, what are the positives of this idea? Mm. You then put a negative thinking hat. What are all the negatives of this idea? And there's, there's different hats. And if you, you read the book, it's fascinating. Yeah. And so what we try and employ is detachment from our ideas. You can come up with an idea. You can come up with how you want to drive the business forward. But you have to be detached from it being yours. Let's mm. together figure out which is the best idea. And it's hard to do that. It's, it sounds really yeah. hard it's, to be able hard. to do that, to well, yeah. accept that that idea is not your own. So. A absolutely. But then if you think as if I'm a leader mm. and I've employed these people in my business, there's a reason why I've employed them. Mm. I've employed them for their ideas. Right. Yeah. So if I really do want to take credit for it, I could take credit in, in saying, well, I employed you. Let me hear your idea. And therefore I'll take credit. I mean, yeah. you, don't, you don't have to do it that way. I don't do it that way. But if you really needed to, that's a that's a, a lens with which you can look at it. No, that's really interesting. Almost taking other people's opinions into account, especially mm. if their opinion is potentially better than yours being open-minded yeah. to accepting it mm. for sure yeah. i'm going to talk to you a little bit about purpose sure. because it's interesting i read online that whilst you're on the trading floor at merrill lynch mm -hmm. you looked around and you saw that there were other people especially on your commute mm -hmm. other people around you that were exhausted that were glued to their phones it made you contemplate your own purpose and you, you, you felt a lack of fulfillment. And as a result, you've been sharing feel good music, mantra meditation. How did you know that mantra meditation, this feel good music was mm. going to lead you to your purpose? I heard this great quote the other day that purpose is the only backdrop you can put against suffering in life. And we all go through suffering. We go through hard times. Just sometimes living itself can be can be a challenge in terms of trying to find the joy in things. Mm -hmm. And as I was looking around, like you said, I was looking around on, on the tube one mm. day. Everybody looked so miserable that day. And I guess it's the, the English weather sometimes. <laughs> but, but everybody looked so sad. And, and you'll reflect on this when you go on the train or, or any public transport. We're, we're all heading towards doing something, but not everybody is satisfied in, in what they're doing. And, and I'm not trying to say that people aren't living fulfilling lives or, or judging anybody or anything like that. Mm. But I just realized I can't do this. I, I need to do something else. And mm. um, for me, the, this desire was so strong. This pull was, I can't imagine myself doing this for the next 20, 30 years. Mm. I need to do something where I feel fulfilled. And so... It was a brave step, but I gave my resignation in and then and then went and, and pursued coaching. I had to take a big salary cut, etc. My 
friends and family said, are you mad? Are you crazy? Mm. Especially coming from an immigrant family. Mm. When I'm telling my dad, I said, look, I'm earning this much and I'm going to, I'm going to quit and I'm going to take a pay cut. And he's like, son, what are you doing? <laughs> like You went through all this education to get this. You're yeah. at the pinnacle. You've yeah. achieved it. Yeah. So, but it doesn't feel like the pinnacle. Yeah. 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 And so for me, I realized I had to do something where I was directly engaging with people it's my nature to work with people and i had to strongly follow that nature and now when i work with young people i'll say to them follow what you like doing and what you are good at and if you do that well it isn't the idea isn't just to play around with it but if you do it properly you do it well then all the results will come mm. at least the first result will come that you feel satisfied with what you're doing and then people will pay you to do it. If you are genuinely good at it mm -hmm. and you enjoy it, you will put the work into it to make sure that it shines and then people will pay you to do that. Mm. And, and I believe that my experience has demonstrated that. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I've even contemplated what my purpose was. Okay. And a lot of the things that you're saying, mm. I, I resonate with it okay. because I've even felt a lack of fulfillment at times mm -hmm. in my career. And so I've been searching for what makes me happy. What what do I enjoy? What, what am I actually truly good at? Mm. What do people do in situations where they don't know what they enjoy and they don't know what they're good at? Mm -hmm. How do they figure out? what that is it, it's, it's really hard and, and often in our coaching programs we'll we'll have to talk about that and we talk about this idea of the brain and the brain has four distinct areas it, mm. it's it's an incredible science and I, I haven't got the time to get into it today sure. but the four the, the brain has four distinct areas and each area is responsible for a a type of thing if you like so for example my front right is responsible for taking risk is responsible for putting myself into new situations is responsible for some level of creativity my my basal right is responsible for emotions friendships my basal left is responsible for organize organization and routine and my my front left is responsible for deep mathematics and philosophical thoughts and so each of us just like you have a preference for being left-handed or right-handed mm. you have a preference for one of these quadrants mm -hmm. one of these quadrants the the connections are just far stronger than in any of the other quadrants and it's a preference you can have that preference from birth it, there's there's this idea of nature versus nurture mm. um, but you will have a preference. And if you can understand which one of those is your preference, you can then find work that's aligned to that preference and you feel good doing that work. I was lucky that I had the opportunity to explore this idea, this model, and I realized I love working with people. Mm -hmm. I like solving mathematical problems as well. And if I could combine those two things together, then I've got the career for me. And I was able to do that and then follow that path. Mm -hmm. But there's other layers to it as well. Some mm -hmm. people are good at being entrepreneurs. Some people aren't good at being entrepreneurs. Some people will work in an organization. The problem that we have is that because we see people doing so many different things, it's so easy to be pulled into different directions. Yeah. If you look on Instagram, you've got people doing incredible things. Comparing. Yeah. And you're constantly comparing. Well, what if I did this? Or what if I did that? What if I did that? Would that make me happy? Yeah. So we, we have to take that time to understand our nature and then not not be distracted by other people's nature as well. Yeah, definitely. You have to almost ignore the white noise that's out there because I even I'm a um I I would say that I'm guilty of it too. That with Instagram, LinkedIn, yeah. all of these different platforms, it's so easy to compare yourself to what everybody else is doing, and mm -hmm. then you think to yourself, "Gosh, I've got to do the same thing." Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to get get out of that mindset. Mm -hmm. How do people get out of that mindset of Instagram versus reality? Spend less time on Instagram. <laughs> Obviously, listen to this podcast, etc. Yeah, listen to this too. <laughs> but you have to regulate it. You have to, you have to choose what you bring into your mind. It's right. That that bit is the choice. Mm. And if you know that when I'm on Instagram, I don't feel good about myself or I mm. get distracted because I'm looking at other people's journey. Yeah. Stop spending time on Instagram. Mm. There's this there's this great saying that that I have. I heard it from somebody else that we believe in mind over matter but if you don't mind it doesn't matter is, mm. is what i say and so if we are looking at instagram we're looking at what people are doing and then we start to mind about it then it really does matter to us but sure. if i choose to to not have that 
and I don't mind, then it then it won't matter too much to me. Mm, yeah, definitely. This ties in with my next point okay. because you've also spoken quite openly on yeah. on LinkedIn about something called conditional le- living. Okay. I think it's a concept that you've coined. Okay. But the idea being that we're not truly happy, we're not truly content until we've achieved a certain milestone mm-hmm. or goal or we've set up that business. Yeah. Why do so many people live a conditioned lifestyle? Great, great question. And I'll explain what I mean by conditional mm. lifestyle. We're always living this idea of when I get this, I'll be happy. So let's say I'm at university and Mm. I'm doing really well and I'm looking forward to getting a job. I think when I get my job, then it won't life be amazing because then I'll be settled. I'll have a I'll have a great life. I'll be living in London or wherever. And then you get your job and you think, well, when I get my first bonus, then I can buy a car and life will be great. And when I meet a partner, then I'll be settled and I'll be happy. And then you meet a partner. Then like, when I have a child, <laughs> I'll be really <laughs> happy. It's, yeah, it's just, it just it just never ends. And we forget to live in the now and enjoy what's happening now. And so if we find the things that align to our nature, if we find that that purpose that aligns to our nature, then we feel good in the now. We're not worrying too much about that, that future goal giving us happiness. Mm. And it may or may not. And one of the things that we often struggle with and why people aren't so happy is because they're always looking for that result. They think when this happens, when I get that result, I'll be happy. But that result is outside of your control. I mean, you can work really hard. I've had examples of I've been working on deals with clients, really big deals, and I'm I'm, I'm doing everything right. And then COVID happens and suddenly yeah. that, that's out. So the result is almost out of my hands. I can do the best I can possibly do and I should. But if I'm hoping that result will make me happy, quite often it doesn't. When I was a partner in this business and we sold it for a considerable sum, I was a small shareholder and I got a good payout. It was a great day. It was funny because I got the payout, hit my bank account the same day my eldest daughter was born. So it was it was incredible feeling at the time. And I was looking forward to my daughter being born and that, that was wonderful, but also having this payout. And then when it hit my account, I thought, great, this is amazing. It's incredible. And then a few days later, I'm thinking, well, it hasn't really changed anything. <laughs> As in, I still feel exactly the, what, what's yeah. changed now. What do, what do I do now? Yeah. And so often when you re- receive the result, it doesn't give us the impact that we thought it would. Right. And so it's so important to focus on doing the things that align to your nature and that, you in, that you're good at, that you enjoy doing as well. Yeah, definitely. I I think that makes so much sense to me because oftentimes you will be looking to achieve a certain goal and then you've achieved it and it brings you short term happiness. Mm. But really, it's about finding those aspects in life that bring you true happiness and making sure that you pursue them long term. And hopefully that will lead to long term happiness. So that's really interesting. Um, Well, look, this has been an amazing conversation and I've really enjoyed it. Before we finish off, I will ask you, as a coach, what does it mean to you to have a virtuous mindset? To have a virtuous mindset means one big thing for me, being being authentic. So that means if I say I'm going to do something, I do that thing. If I am dealing with people, making sure that I walk the walk or walk the talk if you like so my actions and my words are in alignment when i deal with people quite often we will say things or act in a certain way that that, or say we're acting in a certain way that we're actually not doing Mm. and so for me being authentic is so important and it's liberating as well Mm. when you can be authentic with who you are and where you're at that is when you feel really satisfied so with my team if there's times when I'm struggling where I'll say hey team I'm having a little bit of an off day I don't understand this little thing can you all help me with this then they'll all rally around and go yeah Sanjay let's do this let's solve this problem whereas if I think I have to show them that I know everything then I'll often then we'll often end up in hot water Hmm. so for me a virtuous mindset means your words and your actions are in alignment yeah I really like that. Well, look, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Sanjay, for coming on. (laughs) Absolutely. It's been a pleasure talking to you as well.